everybody. Welcome to this opening plenary to celebrate 50 years of study service term at Goshen College. You'll see the World Music Choir getting in place in front of you, and we're going to open this with a song that was brought back from SST around 2012, 2011 or 2012, from Tanzania. And uh, the person that brought this back is Jay Mast, a 2012 graduate of Goshen College. And uh, he wrote it down, and then this year, the song was rearranged by Ellie Keener, one of our music graduates who is concentrating in composition. And uh, so the words mean this, today you shall abide. You are serving. As for me and my house, we praise the Lord. We shall abide serving. Our Father is God. God doesn't care about our darkness or sin. Kneel down before him offering this song. Come to Jesus now, bowing before our leader. And we offer you <coughs> Baba Ni Mungu.
Good evening and welcome. I'm Rebecca Stoltzfus, the president of Goshen College, and I am really thrilled to be with you here on this historic evening. Fifty years ago this fall, on September 12, 1968, our first official study service term, or SST units, left for Costa Rica, Guadalupe, and Jamaica. In the year that the first Big Mac was sold for 49 cents, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and the first Boeing 747 was flown, the Goshen College faculty voted unanimously to make international education a required part of our core curriculum, with our own faculty leading groups of students in a full academic term of experiential learning in nations that are very different from this one. This was a phenomenal commitment and innovation for any US college or university at that time and continues to make Goshen College outstanding today. And we are so privileged in the room this evening to have some of the founders and creators of SST with us and they will be recognized um, a little bit later in the program. Now, in 2019, our student body has changed, our faculty has changed, the geopolitics of the world has changed, global commerce and communications have changed, the affordability of college has changed. And so, this year, as we celebrate the past 50 years of SST, we have also been imagining its future. I hope that through this conference, we will continue to think boldly and creatively about the future of SST in the context of our unyielding commitments to global citizenship, excellent teaching, and adventuresome learning. This conference comes in the spring semester of our year-long celebration and reflection on our legacy of international education. We began with an all-faculty retreat to focus on our core value of global citizenship. We used a World Cafe methodology to elicit and share our understandings of what this value means to us and what it would mean if we would fully embody this core value in our academics, our student life, our admissions, and our employee experience. Two of our faculty, Dr. David Lind and Dr. Kyle Schlebaugh, worked with the copious narrative data from this World Cafe to create a Goshen College definition of global citizenship, and they will present this in one of the concurrent sessions at 1 p.m. tomorrow. The afternoon sessions will also address the intersections of SST with other Goshen College values, such as environmental sustainability, inclusion, and equity, and transformative education. Last September, around 35 faculty, staff, and students participated in a search conference facilitated by Professor Emeritus David Greenwood, a colleague of mine from Cornell University and a former director of Cornell's Mario Einaudi Center for International Studies. This participatory search conference was designed to address this question. How can GC continue to provide full participation in a distinctive, immersive, intercultural, and academically grounded education that contributes to a just, equitable, and interconnected world? This conference launched several working groups that have been meeting since then, and you will hear reports on the ongoing work arising from the search conference in the concurrent sessions tomorrow at 11 a.m. In the past year, we also affirmed that creating an SST endowment will be a major giving opportunity and priority for us. And I especially want to recognize the Goshen College class of 1969, who will celebrate their 50th anniversary class reunion this fall at our homecoming, 
and they have made this endowment a special project of their class. And that brings us to this campus conference, Global Education for All, Renewing Our Vision. In our plenary evening sessions, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Elaine Meyer Lee from Agnes Scott College, give away the lane, <laughs> and Dr. Ron Crable from the University of Washington, hi Ron, who will speak in our keynote sessions this evening and tomorrow evening. So welcome both of you um, to Goshen College, I might say back to Goshen College. And I also want to welcome Dr. Earl Kellogg, hi Earl, <laughs> who traveled from his winter home in Tucson, Arizona to participate as my personal guest and has accepted to be the role of listener and reflector back to us in tomorrow evening's plenary session. So I want to tell you a little bit about Earl and then I will introduce Elaine. Earl Kellogg is one of higher education's most experienced international educators and leaders with over 40 years of experience as a faculty member, chief international education administrator, association and consortium executive, and a consultant. Most recently, Earl served as associate provost for international affairs and professor of agricultural economics at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, where he remains a professor emeritus. During his leadership at Illinois, the university was recognized by the American Council on Education as one of the nation's outstanding universities in international education. Earl has served as president of the Association of International Education Administrators, is one of only seven fellows of that organization, and was the recipient in 2007 of their award for lifetime achievement and service to international education. And Earl has worked with many partners and donors to connect higher education to international development. For example, with the Ford Foundation, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, American Council of Education's International Commission, and the US Agency for International Development. And he has had significant engagement with universities in Bangladesh, Nigeria, and the Republic of Georgia. Earl is a member of First Mennonite Church of Champaign-Urbana and also serves on the Mennonite Church USA Executive Board. So welcome, Earl. After listening throughout our conference, Earl will offer his distilled observations, affirmations, and challenges to us tomorrow evening. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker for the evening, Dr. Elaine Meyer-Lee. Elaine is Associate Vice President for Global Learning and Leadership Development at Agnes Scott College in Atlanta, Georgia. She works with their summit program to prepare every student, regardless of major, to lead effectively in a global society. And their Agnes Scott's summit program has received a lot of attention and acclaim in the world of liberal arts education. Elaine has served for the past two years as the President and Chair of the Board of NAFSA, the Association of International Educators. Elaine started life as a Hoosier here in the city of Goshen. She participated in Goshen's SST program in Haiti, as did I, and graduated from Earlham College. She later attained her doctorate in education from Harvard University. And prior to her work at Agnes Scott College, she was the director of the Center for Women's Intercultural Leadership at St. Mary's College up the road in South Bend. Elaine comes with broad and deep experience in higher education administration, and in particular, international education in liberal arts college contexts. Under her leadership, Agnes Scott's global education programs were awarded two recognitions by the Institute for International Education in 2019. Their high school award for scholars as drivers of innovation, which recognized their summit program that Elaine directs. And in addition, their 2019 Seal of Excellence Award for meeting goals to dramatically increase study abroad participation rates as part of their Generation Study Abroad Pledge. And let me tell you, for any of us who have ever been responsible for young adults in far-flung places, Elaine won my special affection and respect tonight because she is carrying around with her in her bag all the crisis management and risk management tools for the 
Agnes Scott students who are traveling to their study abroad locations this very evening. So, so for all of us who have felt the responsibility of that, um, we are with you, Elaine, and may your phone not ring. The title of her talk is Getting Beyond, It Changed My Life the value and pedagogy of global learning for 21st century students. Welcome, Elaine. Thank you so much for those kind words, Becky, and also for supporting this whole conference. It is truly a delight to be here with you all. Many thanks to all the people who made this moment possible, in addition to you, uh, incoming director Jan Bender Shetler, director Tom Myers, the faculty, staff, and students of the search conference and that process, the World Music Choir that just made that, that wonderful, beautiful music for us, the facilities folks who set up this space so well for us, all the past creators of the SST program, and the Mennonite founders of this college, all descended from immigrants. Going back even further, I also want to honor the Potawatomi people who originally lived on this land before a very different kind of involuntary intercultural encounter. So I have been asked to share with you tonight a bit of my own experience and provide an overview of some national trends, the outcomes of global learning, why it matters, and how Goshen's vision might fit in with this larger national context. Although I did not spend the majority of my undergraduate years here, I do owe this college for the three different beginnings of my own international education, which eventually led to my career in this field. First, for supporting my father's sabbatical to France when I was in third grade, where I first grew into the awareness of multiple cultural approaches. So I couldn't easily surface any photos of my family in France, so I thought I'd include this one, which I, I believe was taken by Dan Shank when he was taking our passport photos right before we left. And uh, I, it, I just thought it caught me in a particularly attractive phase of my life. <laughs> and uh, I won't out all of my siblings there, but most of them, I think, are in this room, so you can um, figure out they're, they're mostly in more attractive phases. <laughs> in any case, second, I had the college for my own SST experience in Haiti with Abner and Ann Hirschberger in 1985 that even more deeply challenged my own cultural assumptions. Finally, for the TESOL sequence I took with Rosemary Wise one summer that equipped me to teach English abroad and in Boston after graduating. As I was contemplating joining the field, I really appreciated the insights of Hank Weaver telling me all about the field. Time to get rid of that photo. <laughs> so after exploring the field at the master's level, I pursued a doctorate in human development and psychology, it wasn't the school of education, uh, in order to better understand the cognitive and moral development processes around issues of difference that we are all trying to foster in our students, the very aha moments I myself had experienced. After some initial work in assessing such learning and participating my, myself as a faculty leader, I have now been a senior international officer at liberal arts colleges responsible for the global learning curriculum for almost 17 years and have also been deeply engaged in the broader field at the national level with all of those acronyms. Much has changed nationally in study abroad over the 30 years during which I've been involved as those years have happened to be a period of explosive growth and great evolution in infrastructure, communications, technology, and professionalization of the field. The latest count of all students studying abroad in U.S. institutions per year was almost 333,000 compared to just around 75,000 in 1991. It's important to note, however, that there's still plenty of room to grow towards education abroad for all, as this number only represents one out of 10 U.S. Graduate, graduating students, 10%. Back in the early 90s, there were few centralized offices to support study abroad, and the main model were semesters abroad for groups of predominantly white students led by a faculty member, most often a language professor, and most often in Europe. There has been a huge trend since then towards shorter term study abroad, and now 65% of students 
now studying, are now studying for less than a semester. I'm sorry that got sort of small. <laughs> um, many more students of color now study abroad. 29% of those studying abroad in the most recent data, as opposed to 18% 10 years ago. It is important to remember here, though, that, that we still have a long way to go towards proportional representation because students of color overall represent 43% of our students. The fields of study abroad have become much more diverse due to broader faculty participation across disciplines and more efforts to rigorous and comprehensive curricular integration models as well as more sophisticated and explicit addressing of intercultural competence and professional skills. Studying in non-traditional destinations has also grown. Although 54% still head to Europe, China, Japan, Costa Rica, Australia, and South Africa are all also among the top 10 destinations. And a full third of students today are spread out among a huge range of the other countries outside of Europe. Finally, there is much more emphasis on cultural immersion and community-based learning in many, many of the programs, with an increase in direct university enrollment through institutionalized partnerships, as well as service learning pedagogies in faculty-led programs, and what this slide is showing, non-credit, internships, research, volunteering, and work abroad. In fact, another clear recent trend is the recognition that global learning is much more than student mobility, and a new focus on cur curricular approaches that don't involve travel, and I'd be happy to chat more about that at, at the end in our conversation time. But turning back to the older field of study abroad, it has matured into a profession with clear learning outcomes and systematic assessment. I don't have any pretty info infographics to illustrate most of these outcomes, but have divided them into three categories to discuss. Traditional curricular learning, intercultural competence, and social emotional growth. I imagine I'm somewhat preaching to the choir here, but I think Dr. King said, if you don't preach to the choir, they might stop singing. And you all, of all people, have to keep singing. So the data is clear that language acquisition is much more effective through immersion than through regular classroom learning in the US. We also know that compared to 90% of Europeans, only 25% of US adults can speak a second language, and the vast majority of those have been raised bilingual. We have only about 7% of that 25% who are learning, learning a second language in school. So from a workforce perspective, we are clearly at a competitive disadvantage. I heard someone say recently that monolingualism is the new illiteracy and agree that we must continue to support our students' language acquisition. Education abroad also provides invaluable opportunities for discipline-specific knowledge and methods, such as marine biology, art history, international business, archaeology, and field research techniques. In addition, it can be very helpful being able to place a discipline in its cultural context. I remember a chemistry professor, one time, I should have talked to you about this, Hank, telling me one time that her students couldn't possibly study in Russia, where she had research colleagues, because they teach chemistry completely differently there. Since chemicals themselves are clearly the same here and there, I wondered if understanding how the discipline was culturally constructed could be very valuable to our students, being able to collaborate on international research teams in the future. Finally, students can learn much about their specific host region or culture, the geography, the politics, the history, the norms, the culture, and the educational system. I think it's very important that our students realize that the way we learn in the US is actually very unusual in the world context at the higher education level. As students learn and live in another culture, they also have the opportunity to develop new levels of intercultural competence. Many characteristics are involved in people's capacity for intergroup relating and theorists and researchers have parsed and named and grouped these components in many different ways in these dimensions. But tonight, I'm just going to broadly subdivide them into three different categories, cognitive or knowledge, affective and attitudes, and behavior and skills. There is some evidence that indicates 
that the feeling or affective and maybe even unconscious uh, sort of aspect of attitudes is slower to change than the uh, cognitive, the abstract beliefs, but perhaps more, more linked to behavior. But considered altogether, these three areas help educators to assess the complex and interconnected development that takes place when students have daily opportunities to engage with other cultures, both interaction and reflection on that interaction. So regarding the cognitive, studying abroad directly affects students' understanding of cultural difference and cultural interaction. Often that reported as that life-changing, epiphanal kind of experience, that aha I talked about. In addition to knowledge about cultural difference in general, the rich cultural specific knowledge described above can help to overcome prior stereotyped thinking. Students gain new levels of, of awareness of multiple perspectives on complex global issues and also sometimes referred to as developing an international perspective or mindset or worldview or world-mindedness. It's gonna also deepen their understanding of the US and our role in the world. Finally, this kind of studying abroad can affect students' general ability to think critically and reflect on their own personal learning experiences. Turning to attitudes, the primary outcomes of education abroad can be subdivided into attitudes towards self and other. So regarding attitudes towards self, students develop their sense of national and ethnic identity. In other words, their coherent sense of who they are, who they are not, what they stand for, and how they are seen, together with the emotional significance attached to those group memberships. Education abroad participants may think and feel differently about their own culture, nationality, and place in society. This might include critical self-awareness or intrapersonal knowledge, as well as reflection on personal values, belief systems, and vocation. Regarding attitudes towards others, education abroad can improve attitudes towards other cultures so that students think and feel more positively about those of a different culture or country. Although attitudes are primarily affective, referring to how a person feels about relating to those of other cultures, they are interrelated, as mentioned before, with cognitive aspects such as stereotyped thinking about specific cultural groups, or abstract beliefs about, or explanations of intercultural relating. Specific attitudes towards others perceived as different could be increased by education abroad, such as curiosity, openness, decentering, sensitivity, respect, empathy, and appreciation, along with decreases in prejudice, bias, and fear. Clearly, in this context of today's hateful political rhetoric, this type of learning is more important for all of us than ever. Behavioral outcomes may be some of the most desired by international educators, but also some of the hardest to instill and assess. There is evidence, however, the study abroad can increase adaptability, tolerance for ambiguity, cross-cultural communication skills, which is sort of the ability to apply some of those cognitive, that cognitive learning, observational skills, new learning strategies, and the ability to effectively function in multicultural groups, which we'll hear about again later in the career implications. Finally, education abroad can result in much broader social and emotional growth, which parents often particularly notice and appreciate. We often see increases in autonomy, self-direction, confidence, street savviness, maturity, what my students call adulting, problem solving, broader interpersonal and leadership skills, work ethic, and civic engagement. If all of these rich learning outcomes aren't enough for you yet, <laughs> global education also matters because studies have consistently shown that it improves retention and completion rates, raising them by 15 to 19 percent over those who don't study abroad. And this effect is even greater for underrepresented students. Similarly, it is correlated with increases in GPA, as much as twice as high as those, studying, those students who don't study abroad. And not that the GPA is twice as high, the, G, the increase in GPA afterwards is twice as high. And again, this is even more pronounced for underrepresented students. I think we all know that students, and perhaps especially parents, are more and more concerned about career preparation. And there's mounting evidence that the skills and networks from study abroad are helpful in getting into grad school and getting jobs. Here are some of the many statistics from recent studies. One study found 97% of study abroad alumni had jobs within 12 months, compared to 49% who did not study abroad, almost twice as many. 
Another found 19% lower unemployment rates among all study abroad alumni. 78% of study abroad alumni said that they had discussed their study abroad experience in job interviews, and 53% felt their experience had helped them get an offer. In four different studies, between 59 and 64% of employers said study abroad is seen as valuable on a resume. And other studies have found between 17% and 25% higher salaries for study abroad alumni. 64% said that those with international background in their companies are given more responsibility. 40% of US businesses say that they have missed out on opportunities due to lack of staff with inter international experience. In one study, 72% agreed that knowing a second language adds appeal among their candidates. 82% say they're looking for evidence of teamwork in diverse groups, again, that skill we talked about being developed, and 78% say they're looking for inter intercultural empathy and competencies. So these, and some of the other soft skills we talked about, such as curiosity, problem solving, tolerance, and confidence, are becoming increasingly sought after. One study said 92% of employers are looking for those. And they're going to be even more crucial in the future as they are among some of the exact skills that are the most automation proof. Can't really teach a robot empathy. Furthermore, I would argue that they are exactly what liberal arts colleges such as Goshen are the best positioned to teach well. Finally, education abroad can be deeply enjoyable and personally satisfying, providing discovery, adventure, stimulation, new or deeper friendships, intense experiences, and memories. This kind of experience abroad is completely different from a vacation and can be quite difficult to do in any post-graduation context. So all of these positive outcomes for global learning for individual students mean that there can also be great benefits for institutions that commit deeply to providing it. As just a quick case study of this, I can share a few data points from the initial results for my current institution since we, four years ago, reinvented our liberal arts education for the 21st century by infusing global learning and leadership development throughout the curriculum and co-curriculum. This includes sending all of our first year class on week-long global exper immersion experiences at the same time, as you heard, in fact, right now, embedded within the 16 sections of our required four credit spring Global Journeys course with common content on topics such as colonialism and imperialism, diaspora, culture and identity, globalization, and the ethics of travel. Although this summit initiative was intended as a mission-driven growth strategy, our increases in student enrollment have exceeded our expectations. Our incoming classes went from 225 before we started this to 324 this year over just the first four years, so 44% increase, with a 25% increase in yield immediately in the first year. Increasing numbers of our incoming students have said it was important to their decision every year. Uh, Two-thirds the first year, three-quarters the next two years. This year, 95% of our admitted students saying, you know, that, that summit, what we're doing with this, is, is why they want to come. Um, including one of my nieces that I've been really happy to see uh, through her eyes this year. So the classes that we're bringing in have also, become, have also been stronger and more globally focused. They, they, they get it, and they want it, and it's, it's how they want to be equipped to, to be leaders in the world. Our retention showed an immediate increase to a college record of 87%. And as you heard, we have, we, it has brought national recognition um, with awards like you just heard about and, and uh, rankings from US News, the number one most innovative college, the number one for social mobility, and number two for undergraduate teaching. There also seems to be a halo effect on our admitted student surveys, where students rate us comparatively higher to the other schools they're uh, they were considering on aspects that we didn't change at all and have nothing to do with global learning and leadership development, but the, you know, sort of the buzz has, has built a different kind of excitement. This commitment to global learning has attracted major foundation grants and provided great faculty development opportunities. Finally, although I have not run these numbers yet at Agnes, I know that the national data consistently shows higher alumni giving rates among those who have studied abroad than those who haven't. So to turn now to Goshen's colleges global learning within this national context, 
as, as uh, you were hearing from Becky, when Goshen first launched SST 50 years ago, it was truly groundbreaking in a number of ways, very, very well aligned with the college mission and identity. And we are rightly honoring the founders for that foresight tonight. First and foremost, it was unique at the time in being required for all students, but also because of its in-depth service learning and its exclusive focus on non-traditional locations and homestays, again, when a time that you know no one was doing that. It was really just kind of unheard of. Given the major national shifts that I've outlined in the past 30 years, though, although you know, no one has sort of mimicked the exact model, each of those aspects by itself is no longer as unique as it was. Goucher College, Susquehanna College, Soka University all require study abroad now and somehow managed to actually send 100% of their students. And there are others, a number of other schools, including uh, Agnes Scott, who come very close to 100%. Of course, I've already mentioned the great increases in service learning pedagogies, immersion strategies, and non-traditional locations across the field. Although it's certainly much farther outside my own area of expertise, I imagine that the ways that the Mennonite Church itself has also evolved in the last 50 years, becoming much more global and further refining its own relationship to service would also in itself call for a, a re-examination. So I am thrilled by Goshen's commitment to renewing their very own distinctive vision for at this moment, <laughs> rather than resting on its laurels, and believe that many of the very exciting directions emerging now from this search conference are perfectly in sync with some of the best innovations in the field, some of which I've alluded to already and a few others I'd like to highlight. First, I was delighted to meet up with a contingent from Goshen at the, global, at the Summit on Global Service Learning last year where some of the nuances and ethics of the service learning approach are, are debated and shared. And I applaud the recommendations being put forward that I've seen. I've seen some of them. I know work is still ongoing, so I might not be up to the minute. But about you know, clarifying uh, the, that service within, within really all of our models is, is a text for student learning. And the host community is providing that as a gift, and so the reciprocating benefits for those communities must be spelled out clearly and explicitly and separately from that, that service learning. Second, I was very heartened by Goshen's great focus on inclusivity going forward, now that, now that your student body is much more ethnically diverse. The overlap of global learning with domestic diversity has been a central focus of my career and I've been glad to see it growing in prominence in the larger field over the last 30 years, that, that intersection, those coming together of the two. In fact, as one aspect of that, I just came from a conference yesterday, a whole vibrant conference uh, devoted to that intersection, the Diversity Abroad Conference, where I presented in Boston yesterday. Agnes Scott is an unusually diverse college with no racial and ethnic majority and much economic diversity, among other dimensions. And, so, and this is one of the things that drew me there four years ago. And already then, they were sending 52% of their students abroad and in proportional numbers to their whole student body, which is very, very, very rare in the field still. One of the ways that staff accomplished that was through very intentional promotion and pre-departure orientation programming, such as student-run panels on black student perspectives on study abroad and, and various affinity panels for many, many different groups. Now, in designing and running our Journeys course, Agnes's Journeys course, we have put inclusion at the forefront every step of the way. We explicitly acknowledge that the globe includes the US and include each year destinations such as Navajo Nation or Puerto Rico, partly to be sure that undocumented students can go, but partly because we're part of the world. We provide extensive faculty development around creating brave spaces for our students' learning given all of their intersectional identities and the way that those play out in, when you cross cultures and facilitating the difficult conversations that can arise. We analyze all of our assessment results through the lens of, lens of inclusion and have collaborated with colleagues at other schools to more deeply understand the lived experience of our Latinx students while studying abroad, for example. We also um, try to center the global learning available locally 
in, our, in the rest of our curriculum and make sure that it's accessible so that each and every one of our students is prepared to be an effective change agent even if travel is not um, possible for them. Fully attending to diversity, inclusion, and equity is an ongoing journey for all of our institutions, and I really look forward to exchanging further strategies with you all as we keep taking next, the, the next steps and the next steps and the next steps on this road. Partly because of the realities of our students' varying needs, I think you are exactly right in pursuing a, a vision of a unified program of different pathways to the same overall outcomes. Third, I mentioned only briefly the improvements in infrastructure and employment of best practices in the, as the field has matured, but many of the other recommendations that I'm seeing coming out of your processes are very well supported by the current discourse. For example, there's been in recent years a large increase in attention to providing in-depth pre-departure orientation and post-travel reflection opportunities so that education abroad is not some disconnected experience off in a vacuum. There are many resources to draw on in this regard and solid data that these wraparound experiences can make all the difference in the impact of the learning. Also, I personally am passionate about the returns on an investment in quality faculty development in this arena and could talk all night about that subject alone. And uh, in fact, I saw a very, very fascinating recent study that uh, it brought together the large Nessie data on global learning that some of us um, take as a module of the Nessie with, for, for all of our students with the uh, ACE internationalization mapping that looks at where institutions are prioritizing their resources and their efforts in internationalization and it correlated them to try to see what efforts were having the most uh, effect on student learning and generally speaking people are putting the most effort into student mobility, outgoing and incoming, but what actually correlated the most with these out student learning outcomes was faculty development and efforts in the curriculum. So I think that you will find your plans in that regard to be quite fruitful. Finally, while it is wonderful that you're blessed with so much inter internal expertise and right and good that you were starting from that, I commend the, the suggestions I saw about balancing that with broader engagement with the field and potential external partners. At least I, that's what I uh, assumed was implicit in the category of relationship building that I read about and perhaps could be more explicit. Beyond the basic goal of providing context for student global learning, the thickening strands of well-developed institutional, not just personal partnerships can offer increasing incoming exchange student enrollment, faculty development, grant opportunities, community outreach possibilities, and combined resources for working smarter together. Goshen College has so very much to offer, too, and some to gain from the larger global education network, and I really look forward to cheering for you as part of that network as you launch your renewed vision for your next 50 years of global education for all. So I think that's, um, I wanted to make sure and leave plenty of time for really engaging with any of these and, you know, not just questions, but comments and, you know, kicking, kicking the conversation off for the conference. So I think there's two microphones here and lots of people with lots of inter international experience in this, in this audience. My name is Richard Aguirre, I work here at the college. I'm curious about um, how your college has dealt with two issues. One, the understandable concern about safety mm -hmm. in an age of terrorism, and how change in the administration and such a focus on the United States is affecting your students and their interest in studying abroad. Yes, I mean, that could have been a whole nother trend to talk about the changes in the whole risk and crisis management and the litigation environment has been phenomenal in the last couple of decades. And it has, it has really, really impacted uh, everything we, we can do in the field of study abroad and the way we do it. And it's a, a big part of all of our jobs, not, I don't think, the favorite part of any of our jobs, but it absolutely is um, a very, 
um, a very serious responsibility. And, uh, and I mean, I did, we just had a day-long faculty development workshop on this topic, and you know, it was partly my role to sort of set the stage and, and you know, share some of the, the institutional risks. There have been some just incredible lawsuits where uh, some of you have probably heard of them that have been upheld, just you know, enormous judgments against uh, a Hotchkiss, a, a private high school in Connecticut who's had a student who was you know, bitten by a mosquito in Ch China and um, came, came down with encephalitis and uh, partial paralysis and, um, and the school was held you know, liable for huge, huge amounts. So, I mean, of course, the health and safety of our students is our first concern, but there's serious uh, institutional health issues that come up as well. So, so it is, it's, a, it's very real, and we, uh, the, way, the way we approach it, there's, of course, risks everywhere. There's risks, there's risks to living, there's risks in the US. Uh, there's, and so you can't eliminate all risks, but you do what you can to mitigate and manage and respond to, to risks as well as you can. So we do a, a whole lot of training and preparation and documentation, which is, you know, the documentation is obviously, again, coming, coming back to the, the sort of liabilities piece, uh, extremely important, but it's also important as, as part of doing everything you can to support your students. Understanding that, again, there, there is risk, there's risk, uh, everywhere and, and that's part of the stretch, part of the risk, part of the growth comes from getting out of your comfort zone. So there's a lot of best practices in the field in this now. There are, I mean, many, many, many of the large universities now have a full-time person in the international office that's focused, you know, specifically on this. The, the large providers all have that. Obviously small schools, you know, can't do that, but we can draw on their expertise. There's a lot of best practices out there. A lot of the professional associations have, you know, excellent webinars every time a new thing comes up uh, that, that we need to address. We certainly uh, had a lot of work to do before this, you know, sending of everybody at once. Uh, again, and they're, you know, they're 18, and some of them are, um, some of them are actually 17, some of them are minors, and they're, and they have, you know, the whole range of issues that our students have today, health-wise, and um, so we have done, um, there's, you know, there's lots to, to draw on and implement to, to do everything you can to support it, and, 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 and as, as Becky said, I'm carrying around my, my binder with, 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 you know, with the management piece. Um, and then things happen, despite all of that. The very first year we were doing it, uh, you know, in February, we were doing it in March, February, Zika hit pretty much every one of our countries one by one, you know, they were all lighting up on the CNN maps of Zika and, you know, sending women of childbearing age. So, you know, we had to do a whole lot of scrambling. CDC is up the street from us, luckily. They were incredibly helpful. But, you know, it, the, the, there's always a reality. The next year, February was Trump and the travel ban. I'll tell you, I would take Zika any day <laughs> over Trump and the travel ban. That was um, really, really horrible. I mean, we had lots and lots of students who felt very targeted and vulnerable by, by that action. And we were trying to do everything we could to understand the real risks, to reassure them, to do what we could to provide additional support. Also, to let a couple of them opt out who, who felt you know, too, too vulnerable. In fact, it just turned out that I, um, we always create alternatives for the ones that, that need to opt out for some reason at the end. And, so three of our identifiably Muslim students opted out that year, and it just so happened that I was going to be going to Washington, D.C. as part of NAFSA's Advocacy Day, where we, you know, go to the Hill and lobby for immigration first. So I took them with me, and they told their story, and, you know, we, we were able to, um, they had a fantastic experience <laughs> advocating for the end to, you know, inhumane immigration policies. So, um, you know, absolutely, there, again, especially with our population, uh, there w we have had a lot of different um, sensitivities being up in the last two years, and and uh, these you know these conversations about um, brave spaces <laughs> have taken on a very different tone since uh, s since the climate that we're in right now, 
and trying to you know, address those day-to-day -day concerns of those students while also advocating as loud as we can to change them, um, you know, kind of ad addressing it on, on every level. So you know, it, it's absolutely a reality. We can't let it stop us. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's very, very important, more than ever, to, to keep doing this work. Obviously, we were hit hard with, uh, with the um, incoming student uh, declines as, as a result of the travel ban as well. The southeast was hit very hard. I mean, folks can look at a map and see the color of the state, and there was a lot of fear about, about coming to the southeast. And so, you know, our international student incoming enrollment is, is down, and we're trying to take a lot of initiative to counteract that. But it's, uh, you know, it, it comes with the territory, and of course, you know, we, we, we keep students health and safety first, but we also have succeeded in taking, as I said, a wide range. I mean, we, we are deeply committed to accommodations and inclusion along the whole, whole physical and mental health and, um, you know, and accessible education front. So we have a, a team that really, you know, on a case-based basis creates what, whatever accommodations we need to you know, up front to try to um, eliminate risk, but you know, that didn't stop two pickpocketers in Paris yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, we, we um, try to prepare our students to, that's part, of the, that's part of the adaptability and part of the resilience is trying to navigate all that. I don't know if that was kind of where you were going, but mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. I'm Theron Schlabach, maybe a name you remember. Yes, I do. Uh, I, led, I led, the first time we went leading SST was 1970, 71, so it was fairly early in the game, mm -hmm. and I was here when, at the creation. So uh, maybe my, Yay. that and the fact that I'm a historian mm -hmm. of Mennonite history um, maybe those are what lie behind my question. Mm -hmm. uh, I perceive, I have perceived that SST re grew a great deal out of the Mennonite Central Committee tradition exactly. as it flowered after World War II, especially or during World War II uh, when we had to defend ourselves to have a mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. you know, that we did service to, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and then afterward in in spreading around doing relief work and so on. Mm -hmm. um, as I listen to you, uh, the, the one question you you uh, I thought you didn't seem to I, maybe my hearing isn't too good, so that you didn't present data very directly on at least mm -hmm. was what happens to faith development mm -hmm. or to faith mm -hmm. outlook. Uh, and uh, I just wonder whether through all this data, mm -hmm. e if you shake it a little bit, whether you could glean, mm -hmm. uh, glean some of that out too. Do you have any comment on that? Well, I was thinking about that, and I mean, well, so a couple thoughts. Um, when I was at St. Mary's, I was at St. Mary's College, as you heard, for 13 years uh, before moving to, to Agnes Scott, which is a Catholic school, a Holy Cross school, I think you know, and, and, uh, and that was actually a major part of our assessment there, was looking at, uh, you know, we sent students to Rome, we sent students, I mean, everywhere we sent students, there was uh, a lot of care for what the potential would be there for, for, for Catholic connections and, and pastoral care and, and worship. And we did actually assess how students self-reported that aspect of their, well, we assessed both how much that was uh, one of their own goals for their growth. It's very interesting when you ask students ahead of time what they're looking for. I mean, they're honest, and there's a big, big wide range 
strange. Some of them are not looking for intercultural competence, you know, and they'll, they, they kind of tell you, and that's really helpful data to have then to, you know, control for when you look at the results. But, so we asked in advance if that was one of the things they were looking for, and we asked afterwards for sort of self-rated growth in that area and did see significant, um, significant pieces of it. In terms of the larger literature, uh, I mean, vocation definitely comes up. I don't know that I've seen a whole lot in the larger literature, but for sure here, and that's where I was sort of trying to point when I was referencing, trying to, as I said, it's definitely out of my wheelhouse and in yours, but um, you know, how I thought the original connection was that as the church has changed, I think it's absolutely critical to think about what what is today's context and how does that inform the mission and how does that inform what how you're hoping to shape students and that's that you know i know that the 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 a lot has happened with mcc in the last 50 years a lot has happened with you know with with your your broader views of service and so i don't know um the latest enough to say how that should inform what you're doing today but i think it absolutely should and i mean i'm, I'm sure that that's a central question for the search search folks but in terms of actual data outside of what i was collecting myself at st mary's i i don't think i have seen very much on that i'll go check i'll get back to you there <laughs> yeah elaine thank you so much mm -hmm. um for for kicking us off with these ideas and, and national context. One thing that is so striking to me about Goshen College's SST program mm -hmm. is that it's faculty-led. Yes. And in the national context, yes. that's unusual. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to mm -hmm. make yes. note of that. Yes, absolutely. So most s yes. colleges and universities, to mm -hmm. the extent that they mm -hmm. get high numbers in study abroad participation, mm -hmm. are using third-party providers mm -hmm. or exchange programs mm -hmm or um, mm -hmm. consortium where their faculty aren't, aren't involved or are only sporadically involved. Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether you would speak mm -hmm. to us at Goshen mm -hmm. College about that. As we think about envisioning the future, would you encourage mm -hmm. us to oh, hold absolutely. tightly to faculty-led study abroad, or should we consider diversifying our portfolio for our students by exploring mm -hmm. third-party providers and exchange mm -hmm. programs and consortia? Yes, that is a very, a very good point and a good question. And um, I mean, just one point sort of about the history, the, the other kind of model is, was, that was big, was having these kind of um, island campuses that were run by the schools, but were not faculty going in and out of them. So that's a different, and they were, you know, they were faculty, but not, um, not the rotational model. And I think the rotational model is really, really very important, as I said, both um, for the development of the faculty themselves and the way that that trickles down into every class that they teach uh, for every student, you know, no matter where the students do and don't travel, and, uh, and, and for the experience. So I think there's a lot of, lot of real strengths in that model. I know from the um, materials that I read that you're also up against some challenges in that given you know the rise in two career households for example from 30, you know 30, 50 years ago and so the there are as, as, as if you're staying with the semester model real challenges and constraints i i do think that i as i as i think it was said this idea of you know some multiple path, a unified program with multiple pathways with the same outcomes has a whole lot of merit and it's both so that more faculty can participate who might not be able to go in their family situation for a whole semester or for whatever situation and so that there is a little bit of range the same overall learning outcomes but also some possibility to customize individual student learning outcomes by what's going to what's going to suit suit their needs you know the very best so i i think that i think it can be both and i think that you can keep that as a very strong signature piece and um create some flexibility for for some of the challenges that you've run into it for it and and you know there i i think there are upsides to some of the other models um specifically i mean i know i know at least 
in my day here, I don't know, I don't know about 50 years ago, but there were folks also going through the, the uh, uh, BCA program and some other programs that were a little bit more like direct enrollment in a university. For, I mean, sometimes it was the second time, sometimes it was the first, but there are some advantages for some learning needs for some of the kind of outcomes that we mentioned. It's, it's hard to like hit all of those in any one model. So I, I think probably both and. It's, it is, you're right, it is a great strength. The sort of the industry has grown up and there's, um, you know, kind of a lot of outsourcing that I think has some real downsides. Uh, and, and quality partnerships, partnerships where you find a kindred spirit institution in another country that has you know similar goals and you can exchange students and you can exchange faculty and you can have joint you know programs and you can have their your choir go there and their choir come here or you know uh, your education students go there and visit their schools and their education students come to you that that can be a very rich and and you know multifaceted kind of uh, a different model that that you know kind of brings you into this sort of network of, of you know, globalized higher education. So I, I would imagine, I mean, you're, you know, you're doing all the right thinking and you'll come up with the best model, but I would imagine that, um, that you could have that be a strength, but not a one size fits all kind of approach. Any last, anything, I think? I know we've got some re receptioning still to happen and <laughs> some singing still to happen. So thank you. Good evening. My name is Tom Myers. I'm the current director of international education here. It's my great honor to introduce some of the distinguished guests we have with us this evening. Goshen College has an SST program that rests on two groups of people. Our hosts, the people in the country we work with, and our faculty. There is no question that the success of the program is largely because of the wonderful people we work with who help us develop and maintain the study and service programs, our local coordinators, our host families, our language teachers. They are gracious to us in so many ways. We are always given enormous amounts of hospitality, assistance. They go out of their way to help us. They have taught us a great deal about their cultures, helped enormously in understanding their societies. Students learn a great deal simply sitting around the table with their host families or walking alongside of a farmer, a teacher, a healthcare worker on service. I wish we could have brought representatives from all 24 countries that we've had SST in, but that wasn't possible. We're delighted to have this evening friends from two countries. When we moved the China program from Sichuan Normal in Chengdu to China West Normal in Nanchang, I went and investigated the possibilities and I met Ms. Yang Wang Ying. It was my hope that we could create a program where students could live with families, do some form of service in China like they do every, every place else. Wang Ying, who's with us tonight, helped make that possible. She's been a very important part of the program from those early days to the present. She provides invaluable consultation to our leaders in every aspect of the program. Wang Ying, will you please stand? We are also pleased to have partners from Tanzania. Our Tanzania program is unique in that the program has two bases, one in Dar es Salaam and one in the Mara region in the northwest of the country. We have a local coordinator in both Dar and the Mara. During our first unit in Tanzania in 2008, our service coordinator was Theo Odiambo. He was very helpful in setting up those first service assignments. 
In the fall of 2010, his wife Agnes began to teach Swahili class for our students for the first time. She will teach our fourth class in the fall of 2019. Theo and Agnes, we're delighted you are here. We are here. Please stand. There have been 158 faculty leaders in 422 units. It's hard to imagine that SST would have been successful had it not been for the hard work of these people. Leading SST is one of the most rewarding jobs at Goshen College. It's also one of the most challenging. Faculty leaders are teachers, counselors, health managers, accountants, pastors, and the list goes on. In the early days, and I include myself in the early days, we had a landline phone, a manual typewriter, and most of our communication home was via the post. Today, leadership involves cell phones, internet, all kinds of social media. But one thing that has not changed from those early days is that leaders have had an unusual opportunity to get to know students as whole people, not simply students in a classroom. Sometimes we know far more than we could have imagined about our students. For the most part, this is what makes leadership so rewarding. Walking alongside of students, faculty learn to know the rich fabric of another culture, humbly struggle with language, and the many new ways of perceiving another reality. In your program is a list of all the leaders in 24 countries. When you have times, please look through that list and notice there are lots of remarkable people there. Will all the former leaders of SST please stand? And their partners, please stand. There have been five directors of international education at Goshen College, Henry Weaver, Arlen Hunsberger, Ruth Gundon, Wilbur Berkey, and myself. We are so pleased that Arlen and Hank are with us. Unfortunately, Wilbur and Ruth could not be with us. You will also notice at the bottom of the faculty list persons who were in interim roles during times when directors were, were abroad. The two individuals who have been described by one former leader as the giants of the program are Hank Weaver and Arlen Hunsberger. Hank came to the college in the early 60s as a chemistry professor, but he also had an interest in international education from the beginning. He had an NSF grant that was used to help colleagues in the science building to develop relationships with colleagues in their fields in developing countries. As a result of a trip to El Salvador, when he worked for the Council of Mennonite Colleges, he came back and said, consider having a program, an international program in El Salvador. In 1964, Professors Willard and Verna Smith led a pilot program there with 15 students, 15 Goshen College students, which is one of the first prototypes of SST. Later in his work with the Council of Mennonite Colleges, Hank took a delegation to Haiti. And there he met a young man who was working for Church World Services at the time. He was so impressed with Arlen Huntsberger, with his unusual cultural sensitivity, they invited him to come help establish the first SST programs in the fall of 1968. Hank was invited by President Paul Miniger to be the Executive Tech Secretary on the Committee on the Future of the College. And that committee began its work in the fall of 1965. Hank described the committee to me recently as the most creative minds at the college at the time. By the second meeting, they began to talk about the possibility of an international program that would include an international experience for every GC student. In the fall of 1968, the partnership between Hank and Arlen began as Arlen moved to, to Goshen from Pennsylvania and joined the faculty. Here are some comments from former leaders about their roles in the program. Again, Hank and Arlen were the giants who had a vision for international living. Both were not afraid to try something new. They always supported leaders and their ideas. Hank was always positive, never hung on to negative things. He knew how to connect with the right people. 
Hank was a big picture guy. He thought outside the box. He was a person with vision and dogged determinism. He got things done. He had a gift for synthesizing ideas that surfaced in a room and then was able to develop those ideas into a program. He not only developed the idea of SST, but he was able to take the idea to the faculty, guiding them and pulling them in. Arlen was always positive. He always thanked leaders, always was a strong backstop. Arlen was a negotiator. He was able to make vital connections in each country where we set up a program. Even though he didn't learn the language in every country, he had an uncanny ability to relate to people at all levels of society. He could work with diplomats and also talk to the person he met in the marketplace. Arlen was the kind of person with the skills needed to understand another culture. Hank and Arlen, we owe you a lot. Your work helped establish this wonderful program we know as SST. Please stand and be recognized. It's a pleasure to be here tonight for this SST celebration and to honor the work of Tom Myers as he prepares to retire. My name is Anita Stalder. I was the academic dean here at Goshen College for much of the time that Tom served as the director of international education. Actually, Tom has had several different lives here at Goshen College over the last 36 years. He was a sociology professor, a frequent SST faculty leader, Associate Academic Dean and Director of International Education. Since this is a celebration of Goshen's SST program, I'm limiting my comments tonight to this last role. For those who love to travel and learn, the Director of International Education sounds like the perfect job. You get to oversee unique learning opportunities for liberal arts college students within an established global program, and you get to work with committed faculty members and supportive host country professionals to arrange for and support immersive study abroad experiences like hiking the Great Wall of China or the trails to Machu Picchu, eating nasi goreng in Indonesia, listening to an internationally recognized author talk about her political revealing family autobiography, roaming through a historic market in Egypt, watching students play soccer with host families around the world, and the list goes on. And it's true, Tom loves to travel and explore different regions of the world. However, as an academic dean in my past life, I know about both the opportunities as well as the challenges that come with overseeing an immersive academic international program. At the beginning of the semester, when SST faculty leaders leave the campus, and then when that bus with SST students leave the union building for the airport, Tom gets on his phone, and tracks the planes until they take off and then land safely. Very different from early days. And then there is a need to be on call 24 seven when your faculty colleagues are on the ground with students in countries that are many time zones apart. There's a watch, there's watching global news for signs of political or economic upheaval, dramatic weather events, health concerns, and individual student issues. During these times, Tom leads with a calm, steady presence working with the SST leaders to determine the best way forward. I could go into his office and yell, Tom, there's been an earthquake in Peru. And he would go, yes, yeah, I've already been in touch with the leaders and <laughs> things are under control. And <laughs> Over his time as director of international education, Tom developed a deep respect for local program coordinators and their participation in the SST program. He listens to their perspectives and ideas for the program and responds in ways that they know their input was valued. He supports the SSD faculty leaders, often in communication with them via Skype and country visits during the semester program. Tom recognizes that er learning happens in a variety of ways for individual students, through reading, writing, language study, field trips, living with local host families, and serving in a variety of ways in their local communities, all in a context where faculty leaders serve as supportive guides 
for students who are immersed in cultures and perspectives different from their own. There is the certainty that students will experience an incredible amount of whole person learning in a uniquely designed and perpetuated service learning program, which requires faculty members who commit months or a year of life to teach in an international setting. There is also the understanding that so much has changed since the first SSD programs impacted students who had little, if any, experience or knowledge of our globalizing world into the present day, when globalization is such a given in the lives of many of our students that cultivating a truly local on the ground program is turned inside out in the digital communication age. This position of international education director requires no narrow skill set like loving to travel. This is a work in liberal arts academia, logistics, pre-orientation, post-reflection, cross-cultural communication, language and linguistics, global human resources, crisis management, recruitment, career services, student life and health services. It's the end of the semester, SST semester, and Tom tracks the planes bringing students and leaders back home. The bus rolls into the Union parking lot and tired, excited students exit to waiting family and friends. Tom breathes again and continues to prepare for the next group of students and leaders who will have the opportunity to develop the knowledge and skills necessary to live in today's global society. I know many of you will be able to talk to Tom during the reception, but join me now in thanking him for his years of valuable contributions to international education at Goshen College. My name is Jan Bender-Shetler, and I'm the incoming um, Director of International Education. And before I welcome Marsha Yost uh, to the front, who will be filling in tonight for Ann Buckwalter, who came down with the ubiquitous flu, um, to lead us in the closing hymn that you have in your programs from Tanzania. You will then be dismissed uh, to the Fellowship Hall, where we will have uh, a lovely reception there, but I have a few announcements I want to make. Um, if you open your programs to the center, you will see that this goes on all day tomorrow, 24 hours from now. We're going to be we're going to be wrapping this up. So please join us tomorrow morning to hear from from Hank, from Arlen, from others who uh, were among these founders. Join us for the convocation where students are going to present their views of international education and what's happening. Uh, join us at 11 and 1 at 2. You can look through all of the amazing things where people from all across campus are going to present the things that they have been thinking about. And the goal of this whole conference is to get feedback, to get students and faculty and staff and community people and retired faculty and just everyone to tell us what they think about how this revisioned uh, SST might look. So even if you're watching at home and live streaming, there are places to give feedback. Look on the, uh, the uh, schedule online. Look on the live streaming feed, and you'll see places where you can give us feedback all day tomorrow. tomorrow and each session, there'll be place places to write your feedback. And we really value those things as we think about how to really enact these things. Um, also, come to the exhibit. We have a beautiful um, museum exhibit in the basement of the library of objects and stories brought home from SST. And I think you'll, uh, you'll see how beautifully eclectic it is and lovely. And then finally, we'll have a closing plenary, not here, but in the Humble Center tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, in which Ron Crable will talk more about uh, inclusion and reciprocity and some of those things that, that Elaine brought up tonight. Um, so tonight we will, as, as soon as we finish the song, we will go and have a lovely reception and um, yeah, talk with all the people and, and have a sort of reunion. So thank you so much.
Let's stand. You'll note that there's a leader here. I'll lead the first one. And then we'll have all treble voices lead the second. We will have all the bass clef voices lead the third. And then let's all sing in glorious unison at the end. Do, 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 do. To go to heaven, my heart is longing. How shall we get there without prolonging? The way of Jesus, he changes never. The Savior wants you with him forever. The peace of heaven, all else excelling. The place is celestial where God is dwelling. The way of Jesus, he changes never. The Savior Let's go and celebrate. <laughs>